Hello, Helen. Um, thank you so much for doing this again with us. Hi, Mohan. Hello. Um, I guess I'm going to give you the floor and um, you can go ahead with your presentation. Great. Thanks very much. Um, I hope the internet connection is okay from here in, in Cameroon. Um, so I'm going to just talk through um, one of one specific chapter um, and how it's been related to some of the, the work in the field that I've been doing. Um, so for me, um, from the professional standards, I focused on chapter six, which is managing data and information for protection outcomes. Um, that's partly because I'm working for the Danish Refugee Council, and that's something that uh, we're very focused on in terms of our protection work. Um, and it's also just something that's very much of interest to me, both in my previous positions in Myanmar um, and in other places, um, and in my current work where I'm deployed with the um, DRC um, emergency team, which they call IMPACT, um, where we do startup operations um, and uh, emergency surge, and as well as some gap filling here and there. So at the moment, um, we're starting up the Anglophone crisis response in Cameroon. Um, but uh, a lot of my <laughs> a lot of my examples will be from Myanmar, I'm afraid, because I was there for for quite a long time. Um, so I wanted to start off uh, with um, hopefully it's coming through okay. Um, yeah, I wanted to start off with uh, standard six point one which is protection data and information management must be carried out only by skilled and trained staff using appropriate information management systems and protocols. So this is something that was a real challenge for, for me and for my teams in Myanmar, um, partly because of the context and also just because we were running a very, a very big operation across multiple states. Um, so what we did coming in was we worked on developing standardized questions, standardized questionnaires. We had to really think about the methodologies for collecting protection information, in our case through protection monitoring, that would be appropriate. Um, because, for example, at that stage, the government of Myanmar was requesting official um, approval for anything that looked kind of too much like a regulated assessment or a survey. Um, and that approval process could have taken years. So um, for us, we wanted to look at what would be suitable in that environment. So we work mainly on key informant interviews, focus group discussions, and direct observations, and then use that to, to triangulate the information. But in order to, to do it um, you know, in, a, in a quality way, we work through training teams across uh, different states, training them in how to use survey CTO and then in how to um, connect that to Power BI, um, which has been amazing and uh, the teams loved working with it. Um, and then also importantly, setting up an information sharing protocol because something that we noticed with um, a lot of our teams, um, expats, nationals, um, was that um, people were kind of leaving hard copy papers on desks or they were transferring files through multiple different laptops with the same flash drive that maybe got viruses on it and things like that. Um, so we wanted to really kind of uh, stop that happening and also regulate how people were communicating through Facebook, through WhatsApp, etc. So. Here's uh, some of our teams in Northern Shan who were working on the survey CTO app um, and um, collecting, um, collecting data from, for protection monitoring. Um, so then from that, we kind of built up this system and hopefully this gives you quite a good idea um, of what I was mentioning, which is collecting that information from the communities through survey CTO, downloading that file, um, saving it in the protected Google Drive uh, that only a limited number of people had access to, um, putting it through Power BI to create those kind of analytics, and then from there into our platform where we could showcase trends. Um, but just sort of, um, obviously this is the process, but the reasoning behind this was that we were gonna use it for response and for advocacy. And we did that um, 
in terms of response, we were using that to create our proposals. So for example, we had a lot of um, trafficking cases that were happening in different states. And so we were using that to confer with the livelihoods team and put together joint proposals with protection and livelihoods where we could provide awareness on cancer trafficking and options for, for families in terms of alternative livelihoods. So we were doing kind of both things concretely at the same time. Um, and we also used this to do a quarterly briefing with, our, um, with some of our donors and other partners in the country um, to try and raise those issues that were coming up and see if they could support, not necessarily through DRC, of course, but through any organization that might be there and, and suited to, to try and respond. Um, so that's 6.1. Um, then for the next uh, for the next point, I was looking at 6.5, um, which is that protection actors must gather and subsequently process protection data and information in an objective, impartial and transparent manner to avoid or minimize the risk of bias and discrimination. Management of protection data and information must be sensitive to age, gender and other factors of diversity. So I've kind of focused on the first section of this, which is um, about having objective, impartial um, information um, and minimizing bias and discrimination. So I think anybody that's run protection monitoring activities knows that this is super challenging um, it's in any environment really. And I certainly found the same thing in Myanmar. Um, so just to give you an idea here, that's hopefully some nice pictures. Here's some of my, uh, my teams going through Rakhine State on some protection monitoring visits. Um, so yeah, it was a huge challenge in Rakhine, for example, where you're only uh, by law, you can only hire people who are not Rohingya, so who are Rakhine or um, Bamar or one of the other ethnic groups of, of Myanmar. Um, and then sometimes the kind of feedback you'll get after protection monitoring visits is things like, oh, um, the Rohingya, or they would say Muslims, um, are, um, you know, having a, are perfectly fine, they can go anywhere they want, they just have to use the, the, the back waterways because in the front of the village is a checkpoint. So you have to sort of translate that into, well, actually, there's some pretty major restrictions on movement and, you know, this is what's happening as a result. Or, for example, in Kachin State, we had areas controlled by the Kachin Independence Army um, and a massive amount of support in the community for that armed group and for um, the associated uh, agencies like the Kachin Independence Organization, for example, which is the kind of political group associated with them. And so you would ask in the government controlled areas, how, you know, what are the protection issues? And maybe your teams would say, oh, well, there's been uh, forced recruitment happening or um, there are places where people are being used as human shields. And then you ask what's happening in the non-government controlled areas and the response would be, no, there are no protection issues, everything's perfect. <laughs> so of course we knew that wasn't really the case. And I mean, I don't have the perfect solution for that, to be honest, but um, the way we partly got around it was training. Um, and the other way we partly got around it was triangulating um, the data collected. So using key informant interviews in a slightly, um, uh, uh, I don't know, in a slightly unconventional way, I guess, um, mostly in order to gather that sensitive information rather than that, that person necessarily being an expert on a particular topic. Um, not taking phones through checkpoints, um, directly doing the protection monitoring ourselves, so having a bit more oversight over our teams. Um, yeah, I mean there were no there were no perfect ways, but that was some of the some of the ways that we used the professional standards to try and um, improve the quality of our work. Um, so the next one I highlighted was six point six, which is protection actors should to the degree possible, keep the persons who provided information of the action that has been taken on their behalf and of the ensuing results. So in my experience, this is the hardest part of the process. Um, 
and it's often neglected, which is a real shame. I have to say, I had to kind of dig around for this example because I don't know that uh, I've been great at doing this, but I know that the um, the joint um, IDP profiling service that came to Myanmar in 2016, this is um, a picture from the, the activities they were doing, were fantastic. They did this um, amazing assessment of the camps in Sitway. Um, and then they came back and produced a whole video, managed to set up and uh, screen this video of the results from the assessment, how the, the process of the assessment, to everybody that had been involved in it from the Rohingya communities. And it was extremely well received. The feedback they had was very, very positive. We were working in the same area, so we heard from people also the same thing. They loved seeing how the data was used, how that information was used. Um, and what people were doing to try and improve the situation there. So I thought it was a, yeah, not, I can't take credit for it, but I thought it was a fantastic uh, example. Um, the next one I wanted to highlight was um, 6.17, uh, which is protection actors must ensure accountability for the processing of personal data and sensitive information. They must establish formal procedures for the data and information management process from collection to exchange and archiving or destruction, including coaching of staff and volunteers, monitoring of quality and supervisory mechanisms. Um, so that was um, quite a long one. Um, but I thought what would be interesting to illustrate this was the setup we did of, um, of the Primero system, which is uh, the, over, the overarching um, system which uh, hosts the uh, Child Protection Information Management System Plus and the GPD Information Management System Plus. Um, so the, the new versions of the GPD IMS and CPIMS. Um, and uh, what we did in, in Myanmar was um, we brought together our teams, asked them how they felt about the case management they were doing. Um, they were gathering this information from people, but was it really being systematized in a way that would respond best to their needs? And um, what our team told us and what we got from, our, from the surveys we did with, um, with our um, cases was that the, um, the deadlines for follow-up were not always well adhered to and that sometimes they could be um, delayed follow-up or that teams were not able to, to, uh, to capture this very well and to check on this very well. Um, and so we looked for a way of doing that for our kind of case management and we adapted the, the Primero system in order to do that. Um, but before we were able to do that and working with this fantastic consultant we had, we had to really establish the workflow of who filled out the actual forms, what kind of forms were we talking about, who was checking the forms, who could sign off on them, what was the process of going from one stage to another, and how were we making sure that nobody was falling through the cracks? Um, and so we're in the process of, of rolling out that uh, Primero um, system for It's a system that seems to be going pretty well so far, and it's establishing more accountability for follow-up. So when you first log in, you can actually see, okay, what are the cases that I should be dealing with today? And, how, and has my supervisor highlighted any cases where I should be following up immediately? And so hopefully that's also having the impact of greater accountability to our cases, um, which was you know, the idea behind um, improving the system in the first place. So, um, uh, yeah, and you can see here the picture, which is from our training, um, who, this is a, a photo from one of our team's Facebook, <laughs> um, because they were, they were bragging about loving the training for, for learning Primera. So the, the final one I wanted to highlight was 6.7, which is that per, a protection actors should be um, explicit in the, the level of re reliability and precision of the data and information they collect uh, use or share. Um, so for this, um, what we're trying to do in the, in the area where I'm working now in the southwest uh, region of Cameroon is set up an interactive um, directory of services. So um, 
it's that kind of standard idea of service mapping, but hopefully um, in a way that is a little bit more precise about um, updating data and easier for us to share and for other people to use so that people in the community feel um, that they have more access to that, that information and, and are able to make uh, the best choices for, for, for their um, situation. Um, so it's uh, it's not a perfect system, obviously. Um, you know, in terms of making referrals, we still need to to look at um, how we would, uh, you know, different systems in place to make sure of the safety of referrals. Um, so this is what we're looking at, at the moment. This is uh, amazing Boya, where I am at the moment in Cameroon, and then hopefully um, you can see that this is the kind of um, system that we're considering using. Uh, let me just share uh, Google Chrome. Um, so hopefully that's coming through now. It's basically like a directory um, engine system. So we would be able to put in the types of um, systems available, or the types of services available, sorry, so a health service, what location it would be at um, and do under keywords. This is uh, not the service directory, but just um, an example of, of the kind of system we'd like to use. Um, so yeah, I think that's uh, I think that's everything from me. Um, any questions? Thank you so much, Helen. That was that was great. Uh, I I want to ask you two questions here. Um, mm -hmm. The first one is. Um, uh, in the protocol you put together, uh, did you distinguish between different apps? Uh, I mean, did you have different level of data protection depending on the app? In the ISP, yes, we did. Um, so, um, yeah, we, we pretty much banned any kind of information sharing um, of any protection information at all, you know, identifiable, non-identifiable, just everything was totally banned for Facebook. Um, because Facebook has really low levels of data protection. So it's not encrypted, um, it can be easily viewed by anybody. And um, I, I mean, probably you're aware that in Myanmar, Facebook was, um, you know, really, really used to, to, to stoke hatred and to stoke violence. So wanted to kind of co totally, <laughs> totally shut down Facebook usage. And then um, we did uh, distinguish between that and say WhatsApp or Signal. Um, Signal has obviously got the highest level of data protection. So if people needed to send um, very secure messages, we would suggest through Signal, just making sure that their phones also had password protection on them. Um, WhatsApp is okay. I mean, it does have, you can do encryption end to end, but it's also possible for people to, to access if they, you know, if they're really looking, let's say. Um, so yeah, we did put in, we put in different procedures for those, for those different types of, uh, of um, communication systems. Okay. Um, then my, my second question is, if you can go back to uh, the last slide you shared at uh, 6.7. Mm -hmm. um, sure. Have you started using that system and um, how is it working? So we haven't started using it uh, yet, uh, but at the moment we're looking into uh, so different systems. So um, yeah, one of the things I was really hoping to ask from the webinar, if it's okay, is to see if anybody has any um, systems that they've been using or any like good practices for, for service directories, interactive service directories, um, because I would I would love to, to hear. Um, this is just one that we're, we're looking at at the moment, but very open to hear from people who have um, amazing ideas that they've been using. Um, I don't know if it's possible to put my, put my email address um, somewhere online for people to contact me. Sure. Sure, absolutely. Okay. Perfect. All right. Um, all right. Um, that was great. Thank you so much, Helen. Uh, I don't know if you have sure. any, no anything, anything else to add? No, I think that's it for me. Thanks very much, Mohan. Thank you so much for giving us the time again. Sure, of course. Hope you have a nice rest of the day. Thanks very much. Okay. Bye-bye.